Welcome back everybody. This is the Monad mini-series in which we take one video at a time to explain individual concepts that will help us best understand monads. And the concept we're covering in this video is a basic introduction to functors. Now I want to give a special thanks to start this video to a couple different people. One of them knows who I am. That is the Evil Soft on YouTube. I believe his name is Ian. He directed me to the Fantasyland spec which is a sort of standard for implementing functional programming in JavaScript. This will prevent me from mixing Haskell terminology with JavaScript, which I did in my original Monad video, and uh, he pointed out that could be confusing. So shout out to him and to Brian Lonsdorf, who certainly does not know who I am, uh, but he gives some really solid examples in a lot of the stuff that he does, and I'm going to be expanding upon those um, and explaining them in my own way. So let's give credit where credit is due and now move on to discussing functors. We are going to understand functors by going through this little checklist of what a functor is. So first things first, we have a container with somewhere to store value or values. So a value or multiple values. Some way of applying a function to those values or that value if there's only one, and it must return those values or value in the same context. If that makes no sense to you, perfect. You are the prime candidate for watching this video. So first of all, we need to create a container in order to create a functor. We'll just call it my functor. All right, this will be your first functor you've ever made if you are brand new to all this. And the container we'll choose will be an object. There we go, we're, we're already part of the way there. We have a container in the form of an object literal. Now we just need somewhere to store values. So let's do value and we'll just use, I don't know, uh, the function we'll use will take numbers. So let's just use the number one. I'll add a little type signature here. Uh, this, is this is not uh, official in any way. I'm just adding it up here as a sort of signal to you guys what our type constraint is. In my functor is an object with a value property that, that must be a type of number. All right. So now we've completely checked off the first part. It's a container with somewhere to store values. In this case, we'll be storing a value on the value property. And in this case, our value is one. Now, we need some way of applying a function to those values. So let's start by creating our function. As I said, it will just be add one. So it will just take a value and return that value incremented by one. Now, add one doesn't know how to apply itself to a number that's on a value property inside of an object. So we have to create a bridge between these two things so that ag1 can be applied to the value property. And so let's create, what should we call this method? Um, apply external function. Function. Function, there we go. And as you might expect, it's a function. It's going to take a function, which I'll just call f, and it will simply return f with this dot value passed in as its argument. And so now, if we call apply external function as a method of my functor, the context for this will be my functor, which means this dot value will point to the value on line 9, which in this case is 1. And we will apply the function that was passed in to the method, to that value, and we'll get a new value back. So that's our way of applying an outer function to the value. But we have one more condition. Must return values in the same context. Okay, so that one's a little, a little harder to understand. What do I mean? What I mean is that we still have to satisfy our type signature up here. So we can't just return the value, we have to return the value on a value property inside of our functor, which in this case is an object. So let's split this onto a separate line. 
This will just make it easier for us to read, especially with the massive mobile-friendly text size that I try to use. And let's just do something like this. Let me see. Um, create new functor. We'll use object.assign, and we'll use a new empty object, and then we'll just give that new object all of the properties and methods on my functor. And so this is essentially one way of cloning my functor from line 8 to line 14 into the new functor variable. And so now we can just say new functor. Oops, remove that, that's not going to work. Uh, new functor dot value equals f uh, this value and return new functor. All right, so that added a bit more logic, but I think it's still fairly straightforward. We have just created a copy of my functor, but we've replaced the value property with the updated value property. And we've done that by just applying the function that was passed in, which is stored in the f parameter, to the value of one. And so now we can go down here, we can do let results, Restore results equal. Uh, this would be my functor. Apply external function. And it expects a function, so we'll add one. And now we'll console log the result. There we go. And there we go. Now we have value 2. And we still have apply external function as a method on that object. Which means that we've kept the context. So we could chain these together and just keep applying functions as we went. Now, I, th this is an example with one value. And it satisfies all of our conditions. But what if we wanted multiple values? Well, we could do something like make multiple indexes of each value. We could do something like value 1, and then value 2 is 2, value 3 is 3, and so on. Oops, let me just do it this way. There we go. But we already have a container that takes multiple values. We don't have to make one of those. So if we were to do something like uh, let my second functor equal, and then using array, we now have a container with somewhere to store multiple values, which is great. So now we just need some way of applying a function to those values. Well, we already have that, don't we? We do result two my functor, or my second functor, I should say. We have a method on the array object that we can actually use to pass in our add one function. That's called map. And if we pass in map, then we console log result two. Let's see if no, there we go then we still get our updated functor. And what that means is that an array is actually a functor, because as I just said, it sort of slipped out, it satisfies all these conditions. It gets a container, in this case an array literal, with somewhere to store values, which is at each index. And then some way of applying a function to those values is the map method. Map just has to look at each index and until it's gone through all and once it's gone through all the indexes and applied the function to it, it returns a new array, which means that the context is maintained. So in the case of my functor, we need to we need to return a new instance of my functor 
called which we called new functor with the this or sorry with the value property updated in the case of an array it just needs to return a new array with each val with the value at each index transformed by the function that was passed in and for this reason a lot of people will call a functor or will define a functor anything that's mappable and they will use mappable as a shorthand to refer to any functor. So the correct way to actually implement this would be to replace apply external function with map. And then if we run this, now we have our two functors. One that we made, which just holds a value at the value property, has a map method which knows how to grab the value off of that value property and pass and apply a function that was passed into it. And we have our array functor, which stores multiple values, one at each index. And its map also knows how to apply a function to each of those values. And so even though they're both called map, they have unique implementations based on their context. And so one thing that you'll see a lot in functional programming is a slight variation on this syntax because instead of calling methods, it's common to call things in a point-free style. It's, it looks like this. We could actually create a map that will just piggyback on the context. Actually, let's move this down below just so it doesn't clutter the screen. Um, yeah, so we can use map to piggyback on the context. So what does map take? Well, first it takes a function, that's its trans transformation function, and then it needs something to apply that function to. So we'll call it the context, just because we're using this dot value, and it'll make it extremely clear. And so now, all we have to do is return context dot map, so we piggyback on whatever map exists in that context, and we pass f to it which I guess it's actually going to be easier if I just do that. And so now I can replace these method calls. Uh, let's just clear it like that. I can replace the method calls with regular function calls. And now it looks like map knows how to just handle any old functor. But it really, it really does and it doesn't. We're calling every single instance of that applying external function to the value method. We're calling the map every single time, but we're really just stealing the map method from each functor. And that allows us to use map everywhere. It's commonly called fmap. So if you see fmap, that's what it's referring to. Map usually points to a specific implementation of fmap on an array or a list, but it's easy to just understand it as being map. And so now if I save this, assuming I haven't messed anything up, run it, we get the exact same values. So that's all a functor is. It has a contain it is a container with somewhere somewhere to store values that might be on a property, in this case we called it value. It might be at indexes, in the case of an array. And then it has some way of passing in an external function that knows nothing about how those values are stored. That add one doesn't know that three is stored at index two, or that the one on my functor is stored on a value property. Map knows how to do that. Map is the bridge, excuse me, between the world of values and the world of functors. And so it lifts the add one into the functor and applies it to the value. Or it lifts, the, it lifts it into the array and applies it to each value. And then we just return a new instance, a new updated instance of that functor. So it returns a new my functor or returns a new array. Now you might say, okay, well, so every time I make a new my functor, I actually have to copy the implementation of map. So if I wanted to create, for example, my functor 2, and then I was just going to make this a 2, I have to carry the map 
implementation along with that functor. Currently, yes, that is correct. But there is a way where we can make multiple instances of a functor, and this will prevent us from having to carry on this map method hard-coded into every instance because it will simply piggyback on the original creation of that functor. And we'll do that with pointed functors. So if you find this sort of thing interesting, check out that next video. It's going to be awesome. And uh, I'll see you guys there. Bye.